All right, so welcome to the Santa Cruz Queer History webinar. Uh, we are glad you're here. My name is George Kameny and I will be your facilitator for this webinar. These webinars are co-sponsored by the Santa Cruz Museum of Art and History, or MA, and the Santa Cruz Diversity Center. We hope that when the pandemic is over that you will visit the mall here at Santa Cruz in order to see the Santa Cruz Queer History exhibit in person. The exhibit will open online May 1st, so don't forget to check it out. We are learning as we go along, so we appreciate any feedback that you might have. Um, you can join us for future webinars on Tuesdays and Thursdays at 4 p.m. Um, if you have any feedback that you would love to share, you can email us uh, at robdaro74 at gmail.com or go to www.robdaro.us and the MA as well as the Diversity Center websites. <clears throat> um, so just some quick ground rules uh, for this webinar. If you have any questions, please type it in the chat room. Uh, I will ask the questions to the panelists if there is time. Uh, we will not have other speakers uh, aside from our guests, but we will have a hangout time after the recorded session, and you're welcome to participate then. Uh, so now, just a little bit of queer history. Uh, the first thing I would like to note is that Santa Cruz queer, queer history parallels the national LGBTQ plus movement. Uh, and the national LGBTQ plus movement has a big impact on the movement here in Santa Cruz County. Uh, and we see this trend uh, throughout the 1970s um, in specifically when UCSC and, Santa, uh, UCSC and Santa Cruz and Cabrillo College came into being in 1960, there was an interest to further expand uh, the knowledge of queer history and queer people um, and the contribution to the community uh, that was happening in that moment. Santa Cruz County has always been considered an inclusive community, uh, which is why many of us believe that there's very unique people in Santa Cruz to share their stories and what better way to do it than through these webinars. Uh, the other thing to know is that in 1950s, there was a lavender scare, and this is when there are laws against LGBTQ plus people in the government uh, or from being in the military. Um, as a response to that, uh, we saw different organizations that were forming in the 50s and 60s. The uh, Machete Society and Gay Men's Organization uh, was formed in Los Angeles, and the Daughters of uh, Belitis were formed in San Francisco, uh, majority by a group of women. In 1966, we have the Compton Cafeteria riots in San Francisco, which was a little bit of a skirmish between police and drag queens. Uh, the Compton Cafeterias actually ended up closing the next day. Uh, in 1969, we have the Stonewall riots, which some people consider to be the beginning of the modern LGBT Q rights movement. And not too long after that, in 1974, Santa Cruz organizes with the group called LAGMU, a lesbian and gay men's union group that formed in Cabrillo College. And then in 1975, sorry, and then uh, Santa Cruz Pride takes place not too long after that in 1978. Uh, so a lot of really awesome uh, things that are happening both on a national scale and a local level. So it's just really cool to see those parallels there. Now, uh, the reason we're all here. So let's talk about Pajaro Valley Pride a little bit. Uh, the organization was founded in 2015 under the fiscal sponsorship of the First Christian Church. On Sunday, August 21st, 2016, Main Street is officially closed down for the first Pajaro Valley Pride celebration. In 2017, the first Pajaro Valley Pride scholarship is awarded to a local student pursuing a higher education. That's pretty amazing. And in 2018, PVP is presented with the Community Hero Award at the annual Diversity Center Gala, uh, which is the event of the year, some will say, in the local community. 
Um, so I wanted to just give you a quick snapshot of the Grand Marshals that have uh, been honored to initiate the Pajaro Valley Pride March. In 2016, Jimmy Dutra inaugurated the first Pajaro Valley Pride. We have Leslie Reed Harris, who is also the Acting Secretary of Pajaro Valley Pride and will be joining us today. Um, in 2018, Lisa Cisneros from CRLA, uh, an immigrant uh, law office, uh, was awarded uh, for her work and efforts in the community, not just with migrant workers, but also with the LGBTQ plus community. Uh, Alejandra Santiago was our Grand Marshal in 2019, and that was really exciting to see. In fact, uh, if I recall correctly, in 2019, uh, Pride uh, was pretty spectacular and she had a portrait painted of her by the amazing local artist, Paul Richmond, um, during that celebration. And here we have some pretty amazing captured moments. Uh, so we have the Queen of Hearts fundraiser at Franco's Norma Jean's nightclub. And I wanted to highlight this because it was a pretty big moment where you had uh, different local pride organizations coming together and working together to put an event. And this is kind of the, uh, uh, the blood that runs through Pajaro Valley Pride is they, one of their big uh, mission is to really get involved with other orgs, either by helping them sponsor uh, local events or by volunteering at local events. So it's really cool. Here you have the, uh, some of the officers from Pajaro Valley Pride, Monterey Pride, Gilroy Pride, and... Uh, Santa Cruz Pride as well, I believe. The other cool thing is that we have Rockem Sakura right here. I just want to highlight her. She is currently one of the contestants on RuPaul's Drag Race and actually performed at the first Pajaro Valley Pride. Um, she is blowing up at the moment and we're just really excited that she is a part of that journey with Pajaro Valley Pride. Uh, on the other side, we have Ensalvo Colibri Florcorico, which is a really amazing group from San Jose uh, that features uh, uh, men in traditional women Florcorico dress style and, and vice versa, um, and just kind of a fun way to bring a little bit of our community into the traditions of cultures from some of our backgrounds uh, that we see in, in the South County community. Uh, we have our Grand Marshal and President at the 2019 March, and then we have the White Hawk Dancers blessing the first Pajaro Valley Pride in 2016, uh, which is also quite special, and they are a big part of the uh, Watsonville and Pajaro Valley community as well. All right, so at this point, I am going to uh, stop sharing my screen. Hello, I can see you all, um, and I'm just uh, going to go around and... Um, allow my guests to introduce themselves. I'm gonna start it off with Emilio Barajas, the president of Pajaro Valley, uh, vice president of Pajaro Valley Pride. Um, Emilio, if you could just uh, quickly introduce yourself. I would love to know, first off, what brought you here to Santa Cruz County, specifically South County, uh, and, and like why you decided to get involved uh, in, in the community and specifically with Pajaro Valley Pride. So hello everybody, my name is uh, Emilia Baracas. I'm currently the acting vice president. Um, and in, in the inception of Pajaro Valley Pride, I was uh, the president at the time. Uh, so I'm born and raised here in Watsonville, which is part of Santa Cruz County. And I just remember, you know, we didn't have GSAs back then. We didn't have a visible uh, LGBTQ plus organization that was, uh, you know, visible in South County, Watsonville area. So the reason I became involved was to, you know, there's a whole saying, um, being the change you want to see and also allowing other folks to, you know, visibility matters. So having this private organization or an active group of, you know, young leader, leaders, um, definitely, you know, our hope is that we bring that visibility and acceptance factor um, to, you know, not just South County, Watsonville, but also all of Santa Cruz County and the Central Valley. So that was my motivation to become involved. Thank you for sharing, Emilio. Uh, and now I would last, like to ask uh, Leslie Reed Harrison if you could uh, please share what brought you to South, uh, well, what brought you to Santa Cruz County and then specifically why you wanted to get involved in South County and with the Pajaro Valley Pride group. And I should point, Leslie is currently the acting secretary for Pajaro Valley Pride. Hello, everybody. Um, so the reason why I became involved with Pajaro Valley Pride is because I, um, 
I graduated UCSC in 2014 and um, I've been a lifelong activist and um, I was hired by the Diversity Center um, in August of 2014 and I noticed that even though we had um, a support group called Conexiones, that there was very little um, actual boots on the ground, if you will, in Watsonville. And so I uh, realized that as a white ally to the Watsonville community and my um, access to resources through the diversity center, that I would be able to um, provide further access, um, pr provide further resources for South County residents. Um, and instead of just kind of having this idea of, oh, I'm gonna go down to Watsonville and I'm gonna save those poor people down there. I, I tend to be more of a person who's like, let me go down into the community, get involved and see where I can help and how and how I can I can best use um, the 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 resources and and um, the way that I can get involved, um, but not with my own necessarily with my own personal agenda, but just um, being of service to the community. How did you end up in Santa Cruz, Leslie? Um, so I was, thank you for asking, as you can hear, I, I, I have an accent. Um, so I was born and raised in South Africa. Um, and then actually I joined the Hare Krishna movement and ended up in Los Angeles. And then a friend of mine moved up to Santa Cruz and I came to visit one day and I went, oh my God, this is just like Cape Town. And after a um, a year long stay here, 30 years later, I'm still here. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. Um, and now we have Raudel. Uh, Raudel, if you could please share with us what brought you to South County, uh, Santa Cruz County, in Santa Cruz County, and how you got involved in the community, specifically with Pajaro Valley Pride. Well, hi everyone. Um, I'm actually born and raised here in South County, Santa Cruz County. Um, how did I get involved? Well, at first, my love came through science. Well, I wasn't out yet. I was in, I didn't come out till I was 18. Um, so I was, but uh, before I came out, I was still an active member in my community. I would support the environmental science workshop and where I would fundraise my time, you know, give my time to the community and to those who don't have access to to creating technology, like cool stuff from the environment and stuff. But it was then when I left Watsonville that I came out and I started getting more involved in LGBTQ and the LGBT community. And I realized that being, well, once I left Watsonville, I was able to be more myself. And I had to question that for myself. I was like, why wasn't I able to be myself in this, in my hometown, whereas when I went to college, I became more myself. And it was because there's not much resources for queer brown folks in our community. And that's when I wanted to take all the skills that I got from pursuing a higher education and bring them back to my town and use that to allow people to be more themselves growing up and shine brighter and well that's why i joined pvp but um, and i also want to mention that radel is the volunteer coordinator for pajaro valley pride <clears throat> so i didn't want to miss that piece of information um he's pretty amazing at just rallying troops and people and, and getting them to kind of help and and that's amazing um, so thank you guys all for all the work that you do first off um, and i just wanted to say that before we continue so um, I'm gonna go ahead and start the next question. And I guess I wanna ask all of you, and we'll start with Emilio, if that's all right. Uh, and I'm wondering how Pajaro Valley Pride was born. How is this idea, like, how is it created? Uh, what was, what was the, the motivating factor for you um, and this organization to kind of say, hey, 
this needs to happen and we're going to do it. So, you know, one thing we acknowledged, and that was in 2015, um, I should know, uh, 2015, you know, folks came together and, you know, we noticed that there wasn't a consistent pride in the Watsonville area. So we wanted to create a pride that would, one, happen every year to make sure it was consistent. And also that would build bridges into other uh, to other groups. Uh, you know, we've made partnerships or other organizations have come to us to partner. So it's probably came to be is we wanted to make sure that there was visibility, not just one day out of the year, but also year round. And that's what, you know, leaders came together and Sounds like we're having a bit of a connection problem there. Amelia, let us know when you're back. Um, Leslie, I'm hoping, Can oh, you hear there me? we go, yes. And um, Amelia, I was gonna follow up uh, on what you were saying. So I'm just wondering what your role was in all of this. So you talked a little bit about um, you, uh, the, the need for, for a, a little bit of consistency with an event that happens annually. Unfortunately, in South County, that wasn't something that we were able to experience um, as, as our, our Santa Cruz uh, pride did um, and has been around for a long time. But I'm wondering, like, what was your role in that? And um, yeah. Oh, I think we actually lost him. I just saw him leave. So Leslie, if you don't mind picking it up where Emilio left off, if you could just share with me really quickly um, how Pajaro Valley Pride was born, because I know you might have a little bit of a different perspective, and then what your role in that hey, was. How do I do this? Mm -hmm. um, so <laughs> how do I go to full view? Anyway, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna mess around with this now. Um, so Basically, we had been, um, as, as Emilio um, mentioned, um, as Emilio mentioned earlier, um, there had not been a consistent pride in South County. And some of us had been involved with um, another pride committee. And um, we then decided to regroup and find a, a group of folks who were committed, um, you know, kind of for the long haul, um, and um, and we we all made that commitment. Um, and so what happened was was that Pajaro Valley Pride was was born out of that. Um, and we made sure that 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 the committee consisted of folks who are both cis and transgender um, folks from well I was from North County, everybody else was from South County, and that we had a wide range of um, not just gender identity but age as well, so that we we really wanted to have a committee that was um, as inclusive of as many of um, the members of the Watsonville community as possible. So it sounds like there is definitely a need in the South County community just for like a, an organization to be present. Can you tell, tell me a little bit about your role in that of just how Pajaro Valley Pride initiated that presence within South County and overall like what their first mission was? Um, well, I see that Emilio is back. Emilio, can you hear us? Did you, as our, as our vice president, did you want to address that? I just filled in while you were gone, but I see that you're back. So I want to, I want to respect your voice to this conversation. Well, you I can, yeah. I, I got that online. I was having connection problems, so I'm not yeah. sure what was said. Um, um, well, I was just hoping that you can expand on your role in the creation of Pajaro Valley Pride. So um, yeah, if you could please just tell me how, like, the role that you played when the organization first started? So the role that I played when the organization started was uh, president. Um, and that was to 
make and also to build bridges with other organizations um, and sort of you know the one thing uh, a president usually looks inward within the within the group um, so that was you know a lot of the the role but primarily is you know i one of the things that power valley pride does is we do a collective uh, which is a collective decision making not just led by one person and and their own ideas and personalities so that's one of the things that we wanted to avoid uh, but of course you know with with the committee there's you know different roles uh, to play in but you know i just i i i know you're asking what my role was but i'm just going to go back to what power valley pride the way we function is it's just a very yeah. dec yeah. democratic collective thinking and that is something that was missing and we wanted to make sure that it was you know the leaders were the ones making the decision not just one person i think that's really great um thank you for sharing that and just giving us some insight onto the process of how pajaro valley pride kind of operates um and so also if i could add to that george uh sure that's okay so um the other thing that was really important to us was that we noticed that there were a lot of young folks folks like danielle who unfortunately couldn't be on um on the call today who was actually part of the original organizing pride committee um, back in 2008 and raudel where folks who were in high school or even uh, in college where there was other than Conexiones, which was for adults, there wasn't uh, really a place for um, youth um, other than the, the youth, the fledgling youth program that came out of the diversity center. But then once we, we saw young um, queer youth, um, specifically uh, Latine, Latinx um, queer youth who would then go off to college, um, that we felt that there was a need for, for there to be a scholarship program. And we've made a commitment, um, instead of just having Pride as a party, that Pride is actually a year-long organizing event, bringing together members of the community, both socially and with educational activities um, for, for the LGB and T members of our community. Um, and and then of course um, paying it forward to our youth and fundraising for the scholarship which we give to two graduating high schoolers who are going off to community college or university that's really amazing um, and i think a great segue into my next question radel i'm hoping you'd be willing to take this one um, so what i want to know and you guys touched on that a little bit but if you could expand some more is what makes Pajaro Valley Pride successful, but then also what sets you apart from other organizations? So Leslie just talked about how the organization is active throughout the year and not just for that one day of the year to put on the Pride event um, and how there, I, there's a scholarship, which I also mentioned in the timeline. Um, so Raudel, if you could yeah. please share some insights yeah. on that. Well, like much like Emilio said first, that we're a very democratic organization. Uh, it's not a very like I driven group. It's our like a we driven group. Like we do, like we decide together like what's best for the organization and what's best for the community. Um, what has worked out the best for us and what sets us apart is that we're not your stereotypical pride organization. Like we're not. Like we get our funds from our community, we reach out to our community. Um, we're not getting like corporate like money. Like we're getting like actual like money that it's from our community, and the money is given back to the community because we are striving to be a nonprofit organization. And I think that's why we've been so successful because there's no greed behind our organization, and you can sense that from our family bonds that we built. Yeah, for sure. I, you're on mute, George. I was going to say, uh, Leslie, if you could please respond to that as well. So, like, what makes Pajaro Valley Pride successful and what sets you apart from other Pride organizations? 
I think the thing, you know, I've, I've been on a lot of organizing committees of, over the years and the thing that I really appreciate about Pajaro Valley Pride is that we are really um, an organization that operates from the ground up, um, that everybody on the committee has a voice, that we all take responsibility, we share our leadership roles. It's not like there's one person at the top that then dictates um, how, um, you know, what decisions are going to be made, um, that we are, we certainly more of a collective as opposed to a, a hierarchical organization. And like Raudel said, you know, we fundraise within the Watsonville community and we give back to the Watsonville community. Um, and um, like I alluded to earlier, it's, you know, to us, pride isn't just a party. Pride really is about building, and, and um, Emilio mentioned this as well, about building networks with the other local nonprofits there that, are, that have a social justice bent. Um, and that ultimately, that we can, by lived example, um, you know, young adults and middle-aged folks and, and, and older folks can be an example to younger queer folks growing up in Watsonville and in the surrounding community that um, you can be you can be out and proud and if it isn't safe for you to be out because we also recognize that not everybody can be out um, in a way that that other folks can that there is at least a place for you to come and celebrate your queerness. You need to unmute, George. <clears throat> Sorry, I was saying I'm inspired to ask another follow up, but you couldn't hear me. Um, uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm wondering because you're. I, I love all of the successes that you're sharing, and I love this idea that Pride isn't just a big party, but it's a day for the community to come together um, and have an impact. Um, so it's really a celebration of, of people. And but the year. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, but I'm wondering, what were some of the challenges uh, that you experienced, specifically maybe that first year, um, with uh, creating Pajaro Valley Pride and making it successful? Uh, are you asking me specifically yeah. or to the group? Uh, well, um, you at the moment. Okay, so obviously I can only talk from my own experience. Um, but I think that when Pajaro Valley Pride was formed, there was a concern from the larger community about, well, you already have a, um, a pride group in South County. Why are you breaking away? This is going to splinter the community. Um, and so we really had to prove ourselves that, you know, we weren't just doing this for, for fun and games, that we were really committed to um, not just having a one day event, but having events throughout the year and being inclusive to absolutely everybody in the community. So if you come to our Pride event, you will see that there are activities for little kids, there's activities for um, folks who are into drag performance, there's art projects. Um, and then of course we, we actively recruit all the local nonprofits and it's an opportunity for us to then um, build relationships with these nonprofits so that they can decenter their organizations from being um, predominantly a white, cisgender, heterosexual uh, focused organizations to organizations that really center around the more marginalized members of our community. Thank you, Leslie. I keep forgetting to unmute. Sorry, guys. Um, Emilio, I'm going to ask you the same set of questions I did with Raudel and Leslie. So what makes Pajaro Valley Pride successful and what sets you apart from other organizations? What makes Pajaro Valley Pride successful is not only do we focus on specific roles, we incorporate the different talents that everybody in the committee uh, has to offer. Uh, you know, there's folks who are good with social media and they take on social media. There are folks who are good at talking and that's what they focus on. Or there's folks that are good at recruiting volunteers. And, you know, it, we all help each other out. Again, it's not just focused on hierarchy. What makes Baja Valley Pride 
successful, and, and again, I'll say the same is we are a collective. We share ideas. We have different backgrounds. And, you know, one thing, you know, sort of the stereotype of the leaders tend to be, you know, cis gay men or cis gay women. And that's not something that we strive for. We strive for having visibility as, as pride, visibility for just for everybody in the alphabet and everybody's different identity. You know, again, what this is the pride is, we are, we're well known, um, we're well organized, and we use those talents to also uplift other organizations. You know, we've had other prides come to us uh, when they were emerging and asking That's for true. ideas. And, you know, we, we were willing to pitch in, we didn't force our ideas in anybody, we just said, this is what worked for us, um, and how can we partner up with other people? So those are some of the things that make it successful. And the, and the community sees that, again, we're not just about putting up party once a year. We're about being involved with the community year round. Uh, scholarship is a great example is, yeah. you know, we, we encourage higher education for other folks. And we're, we're really, we're doing this for the community. We're not doing this for our own benefit or, you know, to shine, to shine our own uh, hat or, or what have you not. It's just, you know, we, again, we're about empowering leaders. And, you know, the goal too is folks, new folks that come in, you know, we want them to be the president. We don't want to do this role for, for a long time. And, you know, in an organization, if they're not preparing you to go and take lead, then maybe, you know, that sort of makes me anyways question is, what is the motivation of the leader? All right, so you gave us a little bit of the, the sugar or the sweet. Now I want a little bit of the chile, dame lo picante. So um, what are some of the challenges um, that either you guys overcame or maybe you're still facing um, either that first year in Pride from inception or just as a new organization? So one of the biggest challenges that we had is there was a lot of confusion between different groups that were focusing on Pride um, also, we were, you know, the new pride on the block. And usually people tend to be someone skeptical. And first they want to see what it is that you're capable of doing. And it's difficult to show people that what, if, what we can do. If, unfortunately, it all comes down to money. Um, and money is, money is essential in putting on an event, not just for one day, but putting on events for the, the whole year. So it was, you know, there was some convincing of folks to say, this is what we're doing, you know, loosen up, you know, give generous donations when they see it's like, well, you're new, what it is that you have to offer. So that were some of the challenges. And now uh, some of the challenges is, you know, again, we rely a lot on the community. And when, when, when you know, right now, we don't know what the economy has in store. So we're kind of wondering like, you know, what, what can we, what are we able to do? With that said, we're finding creative ways and how to still keep engaged. But it was just that first year was, um, yeah, it, it was education and then showing up for different organizations and just doing the work. So I think the really cool thing about this organization um, is, not only that it's unique, um, but that you guys are so involved in the community. Uh, I love the fact that there's a scholarship that's given every year. I love the fact that I, I see the group, um, I, almost every community event, if not all, well, maybe not all, but most community events in South County, um, and specifically with youth. So I definitely, I want to say, I, I definitely see that passion uh, when it comes to showing up for youth. Um, Raudel, I was hoping maybe you could expand a little bit on the scholarship, um, since uh, we didn't really talk too much about that. I would love to know about how that process got started, what inspired um, a Pride organization to create a scholarship fund. That's pretty incredible. Okay, um, well, let me provide a little bit uh, general back information on that. Well, first, um, when I first met PVP, it was and the whole discussion of PVP started and then deciding to break off into our own type of organization. 
And but this was a time when I was still I was going I was still going to college. I was barely leaving the college, and the organization just started growing up. Well, I was learning somewhere else, but simultaneously I was still in the I was in the background of the organization, just like letting everyone know how I can help and assist because I have my own type of skills that I can still provide to the committee. And well, when I when I and when PVP started, the our that whole discussion of the scholarship was like uh, still debatable, and it's still debatable how we handle it today because we are getting more funds, and we're and when with more money, we have to handle it differently. And when I first, when PVP started their scholarship thing, I was already in college, like it was like my first year, and I was like, hey, like can I still apply for the scholarship if it's my first year? And then they were like, no, you're already in college. Like, we can't really provide that. It's only for, and I was like, wow, like, well, might as well just join and see, like, how we can help with that. And uh, after that, well, now we're, the, the scholarship process is, like I said, is always developing and changing. Um, like, this past year, we gave, we were planning to give two people scholarships, which we haven't done in the past. Um, in the past, we only gave one scholarship and it was like a set amount. It was like a thousand. And then this coming around, we were willing to give like 2,500 to each recipient. And so this, I, I, I wish I was in high school when uh, a year ago before <laughs> so I can apply, but now I'm just part of it and helping the process for other people who are in need. Cause I, I was, I, I come from a low income background and this money helps us a lot. It helps us a long way. It helps us buy a, a book because you know how much those college textbooks cost. And the, uh, that, that's what I have to say. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Radel. Uh, thank you for sharing. And again, I think it just it sets this organization apart. Part of the reason why I was so excited to do this because I feel like this is really history in the making, not just because Pajaro Valley Pride is a new organization that's forming and having some doing amazing things and creating great impact in South County specifically, but because the organization is almost breaking the mold of what typical pride organizations look like. Uh, we actually have Jorge Guillén, the president president of Pajaro Valley Pride who just joined us and I would really love to just take this opportunity to to allow him to introduce himself and um, Jorge if you could just please share with us how you got involved with Pajaro Valley Pride um, and and yeah what that process was like for you. Sure uh, so it's I guess there's no such thing as coincidence uh, but I, I did connect with um, uh, uh, an organizer, uh, Naum, I think you're, uh, you're all familiar with Naum. I actually was talking with him on the bus. I think this was um, a few months before uh, Watsonville Pride and uh, I wasn't really doing much. Um, I, you know, I was, I've been out since I was 24, I'm 35 now, but I, haven't, I hadn't really been involved or you know, been, been part of an active uh, uh, group of activism. And so Naum just started talking to me about Watsonville Pride and, um, <clears throat> you know, that caught my interest. I wanted to do something for the community. I had some time on my hands. I was kind of in, in transition um, of being a Cabrillo student and then a UCSC student. So uh, at the time, it, it, the opportunity was just kind of there. And um, like I said, I don't think there's a coincidence that I was on, on that bus having that conversation. And, um, you know, I felt great. And it felt amazing to connect with people and to see people out and about. And, um, you know, some of the uh, other organizers from um, that group are with PV Pride now. And we just connected well. And we all had this idea of wanting to expand and connect with uh, other community, other LGBT communities in, in the area. And just continue to uh, build bridges with other organizations, with broader community members, and just, um, yeah, just trying to expand and, and um, yeah, make those bridges and um, be seen and felt seen and accepted. And, um, and it's just been kind of like a very fun ride. There's, there's um, you know, challenges, and I'm sure we all face challenges, whether it's as an individual or as part of organizations, you know, we all face challenges. 
Um, but, you know, I, I find myself growing as a person, just being involved with this organization, because uh, it does, you know, it does beg me to ask myself a lot of questions, what I want to say, how do I want to speak, how I want to connect with people. And I think all of that just helps me at a personal level, while also helping the community at large. So um, it's, yeah, it's very fulfilling. And especially right now, just knowing that I have, you know, peers and people that I can connect with and check in with is very reassuring. And so it makes, you know, sheltering in place and isolation not feel entirely isolating. So, <laughs> um, yeah. Thank you for sharing, Jorge. Um, one of the questions I was inspired to ask everyone just in listening to their responses and, and you kind of spoke a little bit to challenges, I would really love to hear uh, from your perspective as to what some of the challenges uh, you felt the organization experienced while it was being formed in its birth uh, or maybe is currently still experiencing. I think just really reaching out to as many folks as we can. Uh, I don't think that's, you know, that there's, there's ever a time where we can be like, yeah, we did it. We we reached out to everyone. Um, I think there's always going to be groups of people that are harder to reach. Um, and I think figuring out those ways of, of reaching those folks is, is a challenge. Um, whether it's because we're not sure, you know, how to use uh, uh, social media platforms more, more effectively, or if we're t not tapping into other platforms that are more effective to, to, to reaching folks. Uh, so for me, I think it's that. Um, yeah, just connecting with, with, with uh, as many people as we can. Um, awesome. And, yeah, and I think the first couple of years, it was like raising funds. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that continues to be a challenge. Um, but, but, you know, we're fortunate because we have a group of people where we're always thinking of different ways to overcome, um, you know, financial barriers. And, and of course, there's also, there's also credit to uh, community members, organizations, businesses that, you know, we reach out to and, you know, we share with them what we want to do and they support us. And, you know, one example was uh, last year we, ch we reached out to Christy McCarthy and she put on a benefit concert for our uh, scholarship fund. And that was amazing, you know, and that's just an example of how people, individuals step up and you know, support us. Um, here in Watsonville, we've had a couple of businesses that, that supported us. Uh, Jalisco's, Ellis at the airport, to name some. You know, we reached out to them and whether they're providing food for fundraisers or money or uh, letting us use um, their, their space to put on events, you know, it just manifests differently. Last year, for example, um, the YWCA, they sponsored um, the space for us to use. And that was a huge, huge, huge support for us. So I think, I think we're very fortunate that people um, are very loving in our community. I think that's also a testament to how much progress has been made in our communities as far as people, you know, supporting LGBTQ uh, people. So, yeah. Um, thank you, Jorge. That was amazing. Uh, thank you. And that you kind of touched a little bit uh, on the question I wanted to ask next, which I'm going to take from our chat. Um, and we had a question about fundraising specifically around scholarship. Um, so how, how does that work? And what does that look like? Um, I know Leslie had responded. So Leslie, I don't know if you want to take the opportunity to share. Oh, you're on mute. Ah, I'm not the only one. Um, um, thanks, George. Never thought I'd ever be on mute. Um, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, you know, the thing that I really appreciate about working with PV Pride is the fact that we, the money that we raise is once again, you know, I'll say from the ground up, you know, we don't have any major um, corporate sponsorship in the way like a lot of the more established prides do. Um, we literally go and use our personal connections that we have within the community and we sit down with people and we ask them for their support. Um, we're busy working on our 5013 5013c status um, up until now um, first christian church of watsonville has very graciously been our fiscal sponsor um, in fact 
Reverend Tino was the very first person that I ever spoke with. I was at a, um, an event and um, he told me about, he was the one who actually told me about um, getting involved with pride. And it was, ju it's just like that. It's like one person talking to another person and, and just building those, those um, individual relationships to get um, the support that we need. And yes, the Christy McCarthy event was enormously successful. And um, Maria Cherum, who no longer lives in uh, Santa Cruz County, was, was um, a big mover and shaker for that. And uh, we were very grateful for all the, the effort that she put into this and, um, and that Christy um, graciously uh, stepped up like she did. Um, and, um, yes, yeah, so really we don't take money from the community foundation. We don't take money from, you know, the, the usual sources that, um, nonprofits will get funding from, whether it's, um, from funding organizations specifically or, you know, corporate America, um, and so I'm very excited. We're in our fourth year now. Fifth, we're going into our fifth year, right? So we're going into our fifth year and we're hoping that with um, establishing our 501c3 status that we can, we can make um, and we can get requests for, for fundraising um, to become more established in South County and um, to be able to have a scholarship fund that is um, consistent um, and, and always have a minimum amount in that fund to be able to support um, young queer folks within the community. And also just to emphasize that the queer, the queer young people that we do support are folks who are involved as youth in the queer community. And so they're already um, you know, they're up and coming young leaders in the Watsonville community and someone like, for example, Rodel, Rodel went off to school and, you know, he came back to Watsonville. In fact, George, you did as well. You know, you, you grew up in Watsonville and then you came back to Watsonville. And so to be able to have more and more young folks do that where they, they see the value in their own community that they grew up in. And so... Yeah, that's that's a big part of, of why we're driven the way we are to to raise money for the scholarship. Yeah, so it's really great. So, uh, there's a lot of community support. Um, I, I know that also Faust Hair Salon has contributed a lot to your scholarship yes, and they've held absolutely. a lot of events. And I think it's really cool and it's in alignment with your mis mission statement of wanting to build those bridge, uh, bridges and, and um, work with other organizations. So it also I think shows that the community is willing to invest in Pajaro Valley Pride and that's a, that's a really powerful statement. Um, before I ask my last question, um, I thought it would be fun if somebody could share. Uh, I know whenever I go to Pajaro, I'm when, to battle, but, when, so, yeah. if uh, we could please all mute our mics. Wait, are you battling against That's Jen? Uh, yeah, Jen needs to mute her mic. Thank you, Jen. <laughs> Um, so I, whenever I'm out to either a Pajaro Valley Pride event or in Santa Cruz, and I know that somebody sees the Pajaro Valley Pride logo, uh, there's always a lot of comments about how beautiful it is and how yeah. symbolic. Everybody knows that Pajaro Valley, Watsonville, South County is a very agricultural community. Um, and obviously that's represented here with the rainbow fields and then the sun and the pajaro. But if you yeah. guys could share to me, uh, with me a little bit, like how did this logo get created and who made this beautiful flag behind me <laughs> it's gorgeous um if jorge i don't know okay. if you would like uh, to answer that sure. uh, so so sergio initially worked on on the logo he had help from another from, from a friend of his and ours uh jamal sergio uh, bartolo the secretary of yes, Pajaro Valley secretary. Pride. sorry the treasurer of Pajaro Valley treasurer. Pride. yes uh, and so, yeah, with, with some support from him, you know, they just were uh, playing around with, we were playing around with different ideas, but ultimately, uh, you know, Sergio came up with this concept and uh, we made minor, I, I don't remember the, the first, first um, version of it, but it's pretty close to, to what it turned out to be. But 
um, yeah, like, you know, they, they came up with it, they, they added the colors, and we just thought, oh my God, this, this, this is it, you know, this is, this is very representative of, of the area where we're all from and who we're trying to reach and what we're trying to accomplish. And I think it does also honor, um, you know, Watsonville's, um, mm -hmm. how do you put it, a cultural awareness, you know, like Watsonville is a, it's, is a agriculture driven community. And, you know, within that community, there's a lot of uh, queer folk, whether they're out or not, you know, yeah. Yeah. just being able to, but that kind of imagery um, in our community, I think, is very empowering. I think it 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 it, it, enc uh, it encapsulates a lot of our identities in in that image. I know for a fact that you know my my parents are both still farm workers, so you know for me that's a beautiful image, and and um, and uh, likely a lot of our folks are also uh, farm workers. So uh, it just, it was just very awesome. And then Enrique, I'm trying to remember his last name. Enrique created our beautiful flag in the in the background. Yeah, I was gonna. I think Leslie, are you you are familiar with Enrique? Um, so if you could please share, because uh, the yes. flag, I mean, it's been photographed. There's beautiful pictures on Instagram, uh, the Pajaronian, the Sentinel. So if you could please share with us who made this beautiful flag. Um, I'm trying to think of Enrique's last name right now. I'm very. It's Ortiz. 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 Gracias. Thank Gracias, Emilio. <laughs> Thanks, Emilio. I'm like looking him up on um, the phone. Yeah, and I believe he also made the Diversity Center's flag as well that they have displayed. Um, but pretty amazing. Uh, so we only have a few minutes. And really, I'm just curious if you each could share with me um, in a quick response, uh, what impact has Pajaro Valley Pride had in the community? Um, whether it's something that you've noticed, something that, that has had a personal impact on you, I really just want to um, learn what you feel, I guess, the, the biggest driver um, or the biggest um, impact that this organization has had. Can I, can I make a suggestion, George? I see that we have a lot of other folks who aren't necessarily committee members, but have certainly um, participated in Watsonville Pride, and I'd love to hear from them, from our community members. Um, so uh, I, I really love that. I don't want to put anyone on the spot. I, I do see Jen and Alina, and I know that both of them have been at our events. Um, yeah. I, uh, that's a great idea. It's a little bit out of the, uh, the normal for us, but let's go ahead and do that. Jen, right. um, if you want to unmute, and I would just love for you to speak about uh, the impact that Pajaro Valley Pride has had on the community. I know that you've volunteered um, with Pajaro Valley Pride and then also just been a guest and attended, and we appreciate everything that you do for us, by the way. Jen, did you want to? I guess that was for me. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's okay. I'm welcome. Oh, I'm so sad I didn't know about this until I just looked at my email. So I look forward to watching the rest. Um, well, as a, a parent, a queer parent in Watsonville, um, and an educator who works with middle and elementary school LGBTQ students, I cannot thank you all enough for all the work you do. And I'm sorry that I flaked out on volunteering more, but um, but I, I love that you're all here and totally appreciate it and it's made a huge impact on our community and it makes me so happy to just be able to tell people, hey, we have a really awesome pride that happens in Watsonville and also the logo is beautiful. <laughs> um, Thank you. So, I mean, I, I can't say enough great things. Last year, I uh, when you had the event at the YWCA, um, we had a bunch of elementary school students who I work with who went and it just filled my heart. It was great. And I also, I, I love everything, but I really, really love the, uh, the Folklorico group who was there. And that was like a huge, I mean, talk about the importance of visibility for, yeah. I, I showed videos of them to all my students. They were like, you could do Folklorico <laughs> and be a man wearing a skirt. It was yeah. just mind blowing. So amazing and makes a huge impact on our community so thank you jen keep doing thank it. you thank you um i did actually we we showed a picture of uh a group of Folklorico colibri or ensemble Folklorico colibri and then i saw your comment about um possibly showing or sharing this with gsa students i think that's great maybe some of the pvp people can show up um but yeah um 
Thank you everyone for coming. Um, we are starting to run a bit short on time. I, I just wanted to kind of take this home and uh, invite you all to visit the mall website as well as the Diversity Center and Rob Darrow uh, to stay informed about the webinars coming in the future. Uh, you can visit pajarovalleypride.org or their Facebook page to find out about events um, or any updates in regards to this year's uh, Pajaro Valley Pride. Um, at this point, we're going to go ahead and stop the recording session and just kind of leave it open for all of you to hang out.